flatten ears to ground, curve shoulder into the hollow of bones of earth beneath you. Hear stories travelling the roads of others, like the hum of a thousand tiny engines. Step over fence lines and valleys that hold more than water. Follow the fading shriek of siren, a sigh from another room, the conversation of birds. Do this before you leave, and our town falls away, shrinking into grid lines and patchwork paddocks, before the fingers of peninsulas and forking rivers fit inside the palm of your hand, before we are lost in the crumpled exhale, a tooth flung to the wind and the only question left is, did you have a good world? Before all of that, close to the nameless streets that lead to mouths full of untapped words, tuned to the hum of a thousand tiny engines. Hi there, welcome to the show. I'm Reagan. This is One Hour with. This is part two of the very first one hour with special, spending one hour with, or technically two hours with, Mr. Paul McDermott. In last week's show, he gave us the first two people that he would love to spend an hour with, and those were Jesus and Maria Sibylla Merriam, the botanical artist. Two very interesting choices, but we've saved the best for last. But we'll get to that. We'll get to that a little later. Uh, Let's kick off the show first with a song from Paul's latest EP, I've Seen the Future and You're Not In It. This is track number four, OCFC. My name's Reagan. I'm here spending one hour today with Paul McDermott. Paul has given us so far in last week's show two people he would like to spend one hour with Jesus and Maria Sibylla Marion. The last person, who would that be, Paul? Myself. Not for any uh, narcissistic reasons. Tell, oh, tell I, me about I, this. <laughs> I must say, I haven't, allowed, I haven't thought of that, but uh, I, can't, I can't rule that out, Reagan. <laughs> I can't rule that out. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I think it's. I think with people generally, we don't um, we don't see ourselves selves as, as other people see us. Other people define us in different ways from how we would define ourselves, and um, even even attempting to be totally objective about what sort of human being I am, I would find it very difficult to to view myself uh, through the eyes uh, of, of someone else. So uh, recently, in the, in that, uh, about four or five years ago, I had an incident where, where three people I thought I was very close to turned on me like a pack of rabid dogs, said I was the most horrible and hideous person in the world, that I needed to have um, therapy to sort out my mind, and that um, 
that uh, basically I was an abomination reminded me of that exorcism back in Canberra when I was uh, when I was seventeen. And um, there's a theme here, Paul. <laughs> yeah, it does seem to be a theme. No. Yeah, no, the first time, first time that was pointed out. Well, I think I was about eleven or something, and the next door neighbour said uh, something along the lines of, um, you know, voice of an angel, mind of the devil. Um, and that's basically been my entire existence. Wow. Um, so, you know, we Those are hatchlings. We are what we are when we, we come out and draw that first breath. But um, uh, this, this damaged me incredibly because these are people that I thought knew me better than probably anyone else on the, the planet. And... Um, and it it, uh, it was really shocking and very difficult, and it um, it certainly caused me great emotional stress and discomfort um, for for a while. Still does, I, I suppose. So I, I think uh, the idea of uh, being able to have a conversation with myself uh, would be great. I might be able to see myself as, as others see me, um, and uh, and understand, um, you know, the reasons behind um, this strange of vile reaction uh, to myself. So can you think of anything you could have done to cause these reactions? No. I'm, I'm, I'm a font of wonder. I'm one of the most beautiful creatures to ever walk the face of the planet Earth. I'm, <laughs> I'm, a, lovely, I'm a lovely human being. And the thing I love most about myself is my humility. <laughs> I don't, I'm feeling I don't, it. Yeah. I don't think it's, that's... I'm very proud of that. Put that on the flag and run it up, run it up the post. <laughs> so I, I've got no idea what it could have been. It could have been my relentless talent. Um, you know, people people are small minded; they get jealous. Um, uh, and I just have a, a plethora of wondrous skills that I can I can get lost in at any 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 hour of the day or night. So you know, I I write a little song, go sit in the corner, do a little drawing. Um, write a little something. Uh, quite happy to be uh, totally alone. Um, you know, most of the time, I, I feel I feel comfortable in my own skin. Mm-hmm. Um, and I did learn uh, that um, that you know many of my friends prefer it that way. That uh, <laughs> they prefer it if I'm by myself, somewhere quiet and away from them. <laughs> I, do, I do tend to put people in accelerated states of entropy that's what I've also noticed about myself like people will rot if they are around me for too long and I don't know if that's something that uh, other people have experienced but in the same way that the clothes fall off me because there's so much acid uh, um, in, my, in my sweat I suspect um, uh, so, so I just rot I rot cotton um, very quickly and and it seems like I have the same effect on on people if they get close to me, um, that uh, they'll just start you know shedding, <laughs> shedding atoms around me. They'll they'll rot. Can you give an example, like can you, a description? Oh, oh, I think I've done great injury to a great number of people over a great many years, but I'm probably a, a, you know absolutely oblivious to it because I'm just skipping merrily through the fields right. uh, as my as my clothes are off away. Um, yeah, my family love me. I think that's. That's uh, that's something, isn't it? Because I know a lot of people, their their families don't care for them at all. Um, but my uh, my family, my my family in Canberra, and my my little family, all seem to love me. So it's it's a bafflement. Well, fascinating conversation. Um, let's just pause it for a moment. Uh, we'll go into a song and come back to it in a little while. Uh, so this is another track of Paul's EP. I've seen the future, and you're not in it. This is no singing, no dancing. Center of the scene, oh, all the time. 
flipped your hands and try not to breathe. No singing, no dancing, no mingling. Go straight home and don't leave. But what if you like going out, getting drunk and falling down on strangers' bed? And waking with no memory of where you are. Hi, I'm Reagan, and this is One Hour With. And today is part two of spending one hour with Paul McDermott. And I wanted to devote this second show to his third choice, which was himself, because it led to some really interesting conversation. So I just want to go back to this acid in your sweat. I'm a bit stuck on that. Is that a, that's a real thing, is it? No, I don't really oh. know why things fall off me. <laughs> but oh my I do. god, I can be pretty gullible sometimes. Right, <laughs> I do. I do tend to. Um, I, I, everything just seems to to rot around me, uh, or it could just be the way I see the world. Um, you know, it's it's like Custer and, the, and flies. It's like uh, Maria and her and 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 nature. Everything everything eventually decays, falls apart, and returns to the earth. I mean, that's part of the process, isn't it? Um, and it's a it's a beautiful process, so you've got to let it happen. Um, you observe this in the people around you. What do you observe? In the rotting? Yeah. How do you, how do you what what do you see happen to people to make you conclude that? Well, I just I just I think I have a, a negative effect sometime on others, um, and, and I certainly thought I did when I was younger. And uh, with the all stars, uh, when I was in that group. Um, in regards to the, you know, we all had these costumes. I, I think one of the reasons mine rotted away so completely was that I never washed it. In fact, it was a source of pride to never wash this uh, the costume. Um, you know, so you would see us, hear us, and, and smell us as well. And it was it was very effective um, with competitive audiences um, because it, it wouldn't matter the the size of a fella if there was some sort of uh, person. In the audience that was, um, you know, heckling, aggressive, um, rude, screaming things out. Uh, it didn't matter the size of that human being or the power. Um, if I if I managed to get their head under my arm, um, they would struggle for about ten seconds, and then they would just go limp, <laughs> just because of the overwhelming um, stench that would uh, that would engulf them. Um, yeah, and that. That costume, that uh, that outfit, that just rotted away. Uh, 
rotted away. All the stitching came apart, had to hold it together with the uh, safety pins. That's where the safety pins came from. It yeah. wasn't decoration. It was, it wasn't, it was necessity. No. <laughs> <laughs> well, in my instance, it wasn't decoration. But, uh, yeah, the, 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 it, you know, it, it, uh, my costume started rotting on tour um, in the UK because we were doing the Edinburgh Festival and we we're doing it every single night, you know, and often doing two or three shows uh, and busking as well. Um, so that was a lot of horror. I used to change my shirts, but I only had one jacket and I only had one set of pants. So um, the the shirts were okay, generally speaking. Um, but the uh, <laughs> but the uh, the jacket didn't fare too well and the pants fell apart. Um, and then at, at the end of one festival, I think it was maybe the second Edinburgh Festival we'd gone to, so maybe uh, 1988 or 89, um, I went off for after the festival for a couple of weeks in Europe traveling around and when I got back uh, we were doing a, a night at a polytech in Leicester and we all we hadn't seen each other for two months uh, the other boys arrived I arrived um, and my my uh, j- jacket and pants and shirt and so on I just thrown them in a plastic bag and tied it up oh. when I finished Edinburgh I didn't wash it or anything and when I took it out of the plastic bag it was like it, it smelt like ammonia, and and it had a viscous had a viscous fluid over it, uh, which was really I mean really disturbing uh, for me. And in the pants there was this uh, this incredibly uh, uh, prolific blue mold that uh, that covered the pants. Oh. It was quite uh, it was quite disturbing. But I found out uh, you know once I slipped back into it, which was like slipping into sort of a pair of wet wet speedos. Uh, by the end of the night, uh, all those all those moulds and all those weird spores seem to have disappeared. So, <laughs> don't know if it was, don't know if it was a particularly good thing wearing that costume on that night. But um, yeah, filled filled with horror, filled with horror. I'm swallowing the vomit. <laughs> <laughs> Disturbing. Oh man! All right, I need uh, I need a moment to get myself together after that. So, Paul, last show you we talked about uh, religion versus nature almost. I wouldn't have called you a naturist and you mentioned to me earlier that you're not, that you don't see yourself as one either. So what's your connection? Um, certainly as someone who who loves drawing. I mean, I, you know, from an early age, loved drawing plants and, uh, um, and certainly plants of... Um, have captured my imagination over the years and as as mentioned animals and insects and and fish and all sorts of uh, different weird and wonderful uh, creatures and as we i think as we progress i think we'll learn more and more that that you know animals are just they're just basically different versions of ourselves Uh, i I think it's quite amazing with uh, some of the social media at the moment with with uh, uh, with, with Twitter and um, so on, where you, where someone will post uh, an image of an animal doing something extraordinarily human. It could, it could be jealousy, it could be anger, it, it could be emotion. Dogs, cats, all sorts of animals, uh, animals that that love being touched or scratched or resting with a human uh, being, um, and displaying strange, uh, almost human. Um, reactions to situations, and I, th- I think we're also discovering that um, that insects aren't as uh, aren't as um, immune immune to emotions as we perhaps think. Mm. I know that's probably going a bit too far, but you know, I was raised always thinking that uh, that, that insects had no care or concern for their for their offspring, but I don't I don't believe that's true anymore. Mm. Have you heard of hunger for words? Sorry, hunger for words. Yeah, hunger number no. four words. It's an Instagram account. It's a speech therapist who's taught her dog to communicate using those push button recordy things. So yeah. her dog pushes those buttons to communicate its thoughts and feelings, and it does have thoughts and feelings, and it's it's just fascinating. Um, and it, and yeah, it proves even more just how similar we are. And so people have used it for cats as well. Um, it's just, yeah, amazing. I, I don't think we, yeah, I, this gets back to the idea of religion once again, because these two 
elements are tied together, I think. They're almost fused. Because when, with, with my upbringing, I think with many people's upbringing, we, we're told that we are the, the paragon of animals. We're the best. We're the superior. And, it's, and we're God's chosen. We're shaped in God's yeah, image. But we're not shaped in God's image, really. We're shaped in the images of, uh, you know, of, of apes, monkeys, dogs, cats. They all have feelings. They may not have the, you know, they don't have the complexity um, uh, of human emotion or human thought, but they certainly have, they certainly have emotions. And to me, nature is uh, nature is the thing we should be enjoying. We're here for such a immensely short space of time mm. and i know this now because i'm, I'm approaching 60 mm. and uh you know just to be able to enjoy the world without the burden of, of feeling that um that someone else is controlling our destiny so why can't people take responsibility for their own existence i think it would be great for the human race to to just finally accept that we control our own destiny you know not god's not going to save us from climate change or uh, or any of the disasters that are coming our way, um, we have to do that. Yeah, it can be too easy to abdicate responsibility to a higher power. Um, so were you doing botanical drawings in art school? Uh, I was very interested in, um, in zoological uh, imagery and, um, and found these uh, encyclopedias once in Sydney and... The images within the book, uh, there were three books. Uh, there was one on mammals, one on fish, one on birds. Mm -hmm. uh, they were they were a Dutch publication, so I couldn't read the writing, which made them sort of more mysterious. And as an art student, um, I had no money really, and um, I was in Sydney with uh, uh, with a little um, excursion that we were on from the art school and found myself at a bookstore. And I think these three books, these volumes cost $50 from an antique bookseller um, just down near Central Station in Sydney mm -hmm. uh, when there used to be antique bookstores around the place. And um, and I, I, that was like three weeks of teeth, um, the $50. So uh, it was a big commitment uh, for me at the time to buy those books. And I bought those books. And the thing that really I found quite beautiful about them and I don't know if you know the story of I think it's Durer's Albert Durer's um, Rhinoceros no. do, you, do you know that there's this, there's this beautiful I think there's a whole book on it someone's written a book on it but I can't remember the name of the author um, Albert Durer uh, German woodcutter and artist um, and really uh, the man that had um, you know beautiful line work in his uh, in his um, his imagery his paintings in his uh, drawings particularly he um uh, he was described what a rhino looks like uh, because there was no other way to you know capture it mm -hmm. and he did uh, a, a rendering of the, the rhino without ever having laid his eyes upon it so it's a very it's a very strange image of a rhino it's uh it's like a Chinese whisper of a rhino yeah. and it's, it's a beautiful, it's such a beautiful illustration, but it doesn't have a lot of uh, real connection to a real rhino. Mm. Um, still, it's, it's amazing. It's beautiful. And I'm sure if you saw it, you would, um, you would know the, you, know, you would know the, the picture. You would have seen it. It's like, it's within popular culture. Mm. And, um, and this book was sort of similar The you know, people, had, explorers had gone out, they'd done their hasty drawings of, marmosets or um, elephants or, or whatever they were but then they would come back um, uh, to Europe and they would tell engravers or artists what they'd seen and they would describe these animals or they would have uh, fragments of uh, drawings to say well this is what the creature was like but when you see the uh, illustrations in this book they're they're all a little bit off they're all a little bit wrong they're like uh, you know we have the gift of, of cameras and photography and and so on that capture animals in a in a very sort of unique way but when you're just uh passing on information and trying to describe things to someone uh you get little you get these inaccuracies and this book is just filled with these uh these beautiful images of of creatures and um and wonderful inaccuracies in regards to uh, how they appear so it's like a it's like a book crammed with visual misinformation 
about um, uh, about what's out there, you know, creating its own sort of um, uh, you know false history of the world or a, a, a mythical place where animals aren't um, exactly uh, as as you would see them in the wild. Yeah. They're romanticised and they've changed. Their their eyes are larger. They sometimes are in family groups when they they're not normally in family groups. And there's all these little uh, inconsistencies. Um, but at the time, it would have been a journal of truth. And you would have opened it up thinking, well, that's exactly what a marmoset looks like or a lemur or whatever. Uh, but uh, with, with the ability to look back now on those images, we realize that um, you know, the scientific truth they were after, they missed by quite a, <laughs> by quite a long way. Yeah. And the other thing that was beautiful about this book, I did, um, I, would, I would take these these uh, these old engravings that are on sort of every every page of these three books, and I would create these uh, slightly surreal uh, pen and ink drawings using parts of the uh, uh, you know parts of creatures and combining them to create my own sort of mythical sort of creatures, and I would number them and and uh, and copy the style of those engravings. And one year, I think it was at the end of my third year at art school. My teacher, Peter Herald, who was a Czech- Czechoslovakian born, uh, was in art schools at the age of 13 in Prague, um, and an incredible teacher, best uh, best teacher I've had in my life. Um, he was he was looking at my work, and um, on these large, uh, giant sheets of uh, you know white or, or cream paper, done these enormous drawings, and he he was looking at them and he said, you know, where, oh Paul, where is this from? He had an interesting voice. <laughs> and he said, uh, where's this from? And I said, oh, it's from this book. And he said, and he went, oh, my God. And I showed him the book. And he went, oh, my God, oh, my God. When I was a young man, when I was 18, I copied this exact drawing. <laughs> so it's a, it was an amazing thing to have that connection um, over time with, with, with Peter. That yeah. uh, we're both obsessed by the, by the same, um, you know, engravings. And, uh, and copper plates and images of animals that were slightly incorrect. Hmm. Okie dokes. Coming to the end of One Hour With, and we've been spending the hour today with Paul McDermott, who has shared with us his third person who he would like to spend one hour with, which was himself, and it led to some fascinating conversation. Okay, so you've chosen a song off your new album, the new album being I've Seen the Future and You're Not In It, and the song is yes. Be Kind. Um when you first suggested that, it was um, it was noted that that it's a bit sweary, and so I had to listen, and it certainly is a bit sweary. <laughs> yeah, it's a bit sweary. <laughs> Why did you choose that song? Uh, well, I thought I thought if anyone was going to play it, uh, maybe three D would. Um, yes, very cool. And yeah, uh, so you know, respect uh, for playing it. Also, because it is essentially, apart from the swearing, um, an uplifting song about the the. Uh, the world we find ourselves in at the moment, and it was prompted by various reactions that have been happening um, in, in the COVID space, the violence and anger, uh, particularly towards science, which I did, is a bafflement once again to me. I don't, I don't understand how we have got to 2021 and we seem to be going almost feudalistic in the way that we um, engage with, with each other. Um, I certainly think social media is probably responsible for some of that amplifying the negative aspects of people's sort of ideologies, uh, like a like a, a loud hailer across the globe, and and anyone can jump on and say anything about anyone, and there seems to be little accountability. Um, so I think that's a that's certainly a, a frightening part of it, but also the hysteria around um, COVID and vaccines, um, the idea that. You know, we all have free speech, but some people have more free speech than others. Um, you know, uh, I believe in free speech, but you've got to shut up now. Mm-hmm. That sort of thing. Um, so I think it, had, it has a it has a, a beautiful message, uh, despite the sweary aspect of it. Unfortunately, um, depending how you see it, I do have to exercise some social responsibility here, especially given the time slot that we are we are broadcasting in. Um, so we have two options. Uh, we could either go with the second choice that you did provide or I could beep out the offending words. What would you prefer? I think the beep. the beep. I love a beep. 
um, I'm, I'm a big fan of the beep. The beep, uh, the beep has worked well for me um, many, many times over the course of my life. And one particular time in Adelaide uh, with the comedy supergroup Gud that I had, we did a song about Rene Rifkin for the Melbourne International Comedy Festival. I don't know if you remember Rene. He was a, he was a Sydney money man. Mm. Had, uh, had a lot of dubious connections. And, um, and we were doing a song about him, uh, about his wealth and so on. Uh, before he he died, and uh, there was uh, there was a line in the song. It was two lines, and we were told by the ABC lawyers that uh, we we couldn't do that that line. Um, and we were also swearing that song. I mean, we said we said uh, some vulgar words in that song, and it it all went out live with the swearing in it. But the two lines <laughs> in the middle of the song got beeped. And the reaction when we came off stage and went downstairs was extraordinary because here were all some of the smartest comedians in Australia who were going, <laughs> coming up to me going, what the hell? What the hell was that line? What did you say? You were swearing in the song, but what, what was worse than swearing? And it created an incredible energy and mystery around the song, um, which the song probably didn't really deserve. But, uh, <laughs> but I, I've, I've always loved to be. Yeah, go to B. Fantastic. Uh, so this is this is Be Kind um, with lots of beeps. And we'll go into that. <laughs> We're fighting for space on the edge of the couch. But we
this has been One Hour With and we are at the end of our One Hour With Paul McDermott. We've spent the show talking about his third choice of people that he'd like to spend an hour with. So to close off the show, Paul, last week we talked about your EP, I've Seen the Future and You're Not In It, which is available on Spotify, iTunes and Bandcamp. We can also find you on Facebook. You've got a, at least two accounts. We're on the socials. So there's Young Come Master on. Paul. <laughs> <laughs> You're learning so much about yourself today. There's Young Master Paul. There's Paul McDermott plus one. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, that's the that's the last show I brought to Adelaide, and um and that's the that's the show I'm doing with Glenn that we haven't been able to do because of COVID, of course, and, uh, and the lockdowns. We lost um we lost so much work uh, this year and last year, um, but hopefully we'll get um we'll get out again and be back on the road um, shortly. People can come and see some of these uh, songs live. And Glenn and I have been doing, and I don't know Facebook. I've always thought it was, you know, the empire of evil, so I've avoided it uh, for most of my life. But we have been doing uh, sort of live performances on on Friday nights. I think we're going to do another one next week. So if people are interested in that, we just um, we have a listening party, listening to the record, and then we 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 sit around and sing some songs and um so that's through your young master paul account yeah it's a nice little grassroots operation you got going well there's only the three of us doing it it's only myself glenn and glenn's partner claire who are who are putting everything out and it's all new frontier stuff for all of us so um but it's been those those little uh you know hour long live sessions on facebook even though we're pretty sort of uh unskilled in that regard they've been they've been fun and we're we're um you know, getting a little loyal following. So it's very nice to have people who want to tune in and, and spend an hour with us on a Friday night. It is. It's entertaining and it's a, it was a nice way to see you as well. Um, so, well, speaking of entertaining and interesting, it has been, Paul, it's been a, 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 a great hour to spend with you. Thank you very much for joining me. Uh, pleasure, Reagan. This has been One Hour with Paul McDermott. And if you would like to spend one hour with me telling 3D Radio listeners about the three people you'd love to spend an hour with, then get in touch with me via Facebook and Instagram, One Hour with Reagan. You can also uh, follow the pages to keep up to date with who's coming on the show the following week and also song lists and various other little bits and pieces that come along. Up next week, join our local singer and poet, the beautiful Jen Lush. I'll catch you next Monday. Have a great day.